Hello everyone, Rob Guest from Football.London here and welcome to the latest episode of Gold and Guest Talk Tottenham, sponsored by NordVPN. Joining me as ever, it's Alistair Gold. Ali, have you recovered from the free free draw at the Etihad last night? Just about, just about. I uh, I did not expect that to happen. I did not expect Spurs to come away with a point with all of the problems, with all the injuries, uh, with the unavailable player or player in Romero. But to be fair to Rob Guest, I should start this by saying that you were slightly unsettlingly and unnervingly uh, quietly confident about Tottenham getting something from this game. I guess the history is there in, in recent kind of games against City, but my goodness, I did not think that patched up side was going to be able to do what it did. And don't get me wrong, they rode their luck at times, but they came away with a really kind of confidence boosting point, I think. Yeah, they did. Uh, obviously, we did our pre-match predictions like a couple of minutes before kickoff. I said either 2-2 two, two or Spurs would nick it 3-2. Uh, they're always got to create chances, Andrew Postacoglu's team. It was just a matter of taking them and that's exactly what they did uh, yesterday at the Etihad but like you said they certainly rode the luck at times and maybe perhaps lucky they were still in the game at half time given the chances City passed up. Yeah and if you want to be really fussy you could say you know they had three four chances against City put three away why could they not have been that clinical against Villa <laughs> but they created about 18 chances the week before um, but I, I never I never like going to the Etihad in terms of it's always one of those, like going to the Emirates, you know it's going to be an uncomfortable evening. It's going to be an uncomfortable match. The weather seems to always be a, bit, a little bit iffy as well when we travel up there for these uh, Spurs games as well. Yet, you know, fair play to the spirit of that team as well. Again, four fullbacks and four wingers. <laughs> it's just ridiculous. And they went out there against the reigning champions of England um and yeah first half they were it was like kind of riding one of those bucking broncos they were kind of clinging on for dear life at times hoping they didn't kind of they get shaken off and the result was just ridiculous and they were very much indebted to the the woodwork to Erlen Haaland was was not good in front of goal at all that was for the man who I thought was going to cause Spurs all kinds of problems and I guess he did to a degree he was actually incredibly wasteful some of the chances he had almost in, in front of open goals at times um, so they had that, but Spurs just kind of clung on in there. And as we saw with Villa, exactly like Villa uh, last week, they just found a way in the second half. They far more, I'm not going to go as far to say they were dominant, but certainly s disrupted City's play a lot and had so much more of the ball. I mean, the, end up, the possession at the end was only, I think it was 55, 45 to City. Um, that first half was nowhere near that. That must have been far, far higher in the first half to City. Um, Spurs, yeah, look good. Some good performances, some performances that weren't so great, and all of it kind of gives us loads to discuss, really. Yeah, there is quite a lot to discuss from the 90 minutes yesterday, and it was just a good thing to see Spurs put an end to that three successive defeats because the last thing they wanted to be doing going into this week's games against West Ham and Newcastle was... You know, coming into it off the back of four successive defeats and it's come to an end and now it's just about putting things right on the pitch and getting back to winning ways and fingers crossed that will be the case on Thursday against West Ham. Right, shall we? We'll discuss the team first up. Uh, pretty much as we expected, I think. I think we probably thought it was either going to be pierre Emil Hoybjerg or Brian Hill in the 11, and it was Brian Hill in the end. Yeah, yeah, that was our predicted team we went with um, on the website. It, it looked like it was going to work in those early stages. You know, Brian Hill having a lovely kind of turn, spin and pass and put Kulusevski away. Kulusevski, I think, it was, was it a first-time ball or certainly a very quick ball into the path of Sonny? And you know what? Sonny is just in City's head, isn't he? he? They cannot deal with him. He scored so many goals against City now. And as soon as he went off on this charging run, it reminded me, not quite to the angle that he went, but it reminded me slightly of the one he scored against Chelsea when he went almost all the way to the touchline back in and scored. But in terms of just the strength and the drive in it, um, just left, who was it he left in his wake? He just it was powered. Doku. Yeah. It was Doku. Yeah, he just powered yeah. past him. Um, and 
yeah, I mean, Edison probably should have done slightly better with it, but it was still a powerful finish. Um, I thought Sonny was really good yesterday. I, he was one that I didn't realise until after the game how many little moments he had of really good link-up play. He's starting to kind of take on that um, the cane job of coming deep, spinning and hitting balls out to the flanks, and he does it really, really well. Um, and he played a part in so many goals, obviously. <laughs> Scored the early goal. Um, own goal off his own thigh at the other end. Um, he set up the Celso's goal, and then he actually played quite a big part in the third goal for Spurs as well. So it was a real all action kind of captain's performance. Um, but in terms of starting 11, it's a difficult one. Like you said, it was two different ways to see it. There's one way is he didn't compromise his principles and he went with the attacking lineup that created so many chances against Villa. But then I think. Going with Hoybier in the second half, I don't think he really compromised his principles in a way. He just adjusted his tactics. And Hoybier, to be fair to him, I think every time Hoybier comes into a game, he's done really well for Spurs. It's almost like he's becoming a bit of a super sub. He's like the, the Solskjaer in a different kind of way. He comes on and really impacts games in a very positive manner. And I felt he did that again yesterday. And Postacoglu was very happy with him after the game. Um, so, yeah, I mean, he could have started with Hoybe. He could have really gone either way, but then maybe it's the butterfly effect, isn't it? Maybe had Brian Hill not been on the pitch earlier and they don't score that first goal. And, you know, who knows? But uh, no, I was I was happy enough with the team. But let's be honest. his first of the evening. Really sharp turn on the box. I think it was Phil Ferdinand on his shoulder. Uh, managed to create a yard of space, released it to Dane Kulisewski, who then obviously put it over the top for Son uh, to take on and score. And I thought uh, Brian did okay in his pitch time. My only concern going into the game was he was going to be up against Kyle Walker, who mm. is, you know, some defender. And yeah, he he gave Walker uh, a couple of troubles at times. He's not like a winger who's just going to be direct and go toe to toe with Walker and try and beat him down the line. He's going to, you know, use his skill, his trickery, cut inside a few times. And yeah, he, he did uh, cause Walker a couple of issues on occasions. But I think there was one bit in the first half when he might have been Kulisescu played the ball across goal for Hill. Uh, who took a touch inside and I think it was just Walker's pace got him uh, there. But yeah. to be honest, I think whoever was on the ball there, they probably lost out because of Walker's uh, recovery pace. It's such a huge, huge asset what he's got. And yeah, I thought Hill did okay. There was one moment I think he should have shot that first yeah. time opportunity he had when I think it was... It might Silver. have been by Bernardo Silva, wasn't it? A loose yeah. ball across City's goal. Edison was probably a good 10, 15 yards out of his uh, off his line. And a first time shot, he might have uh, chipped Edison and uh, scored Spurs' the second of uh, the evening. But instead, tries to take it on and then put a ball across goal, what, what was cut out. So, probably no shocking seeing him uh, withdrawn at half time, but I thought. Hoybier, uh, really, really good performance. I mean, yeah, he's becoming a bit of a super sub, but I don't think it's a really he really wants at Tottenham. But no. it's just good to have this experience on the bench to help Tottenham, you know, either see out a game or help them get back into it. And uh, Hoybier played more than played his part yesterday. Yeah, I thought in terms of Brian Hill, I thought he got progressively worse as the, the calf wore on. He started really brightly. Obviously, he had that moment for the goal. And he did, he kind of, he, he brought Walker inside a couple of times and span him and he did really well. And it, I remember saying to you, it's like, oh, well, there you go. Maybe he's going to give him something different to worry about rather than pace. Um, but as it went on, yeah, he kind of tried to almost, uh, I guess, yeah, outmuscle and outpace Walker, and which you're just never going to do, especially like most players can't, but not certainly someone of, of Brian Hill's statue, you're not going to be able to do that. Um, and it was kind of somewhat, I guess, ironic that it was Pace that beat Walker for the final equalising goal. It was someone who just, like Brennan Johnson, who just sped past him. Um, and I did feel sorry for Brunhill. Like you say, he should have probably had a first-time shot when that ball, when he cut out the ball. He did well to intercept the pass. It was a lovely bit of movement to get there. But And I guess it's easy for us to say on the sideline, you know, oh, you should have seen that. But 
he was just a little too hesitant with some of his touches. And I think that was exactly what Postacoglu didn't want to see and what he hated about the first half. Um, and obviously, you're going to tell us a little bit about his kind of angry team talk that he had at half time. And I think because of that, he probably had to, I guess, almost like make an example of someone and show how annoyed he was and that it had to change. And I guess that's why that change came about. And that's why Brian Hill came off. But uh, yeah, that first half, I mean, he said it himself, Postacoglu, they could have been three, four, one down by half time at least um, with the amount of chances. Like, I mean, even didn't Doku have a, he had an effort that went off the crossbar and post all in one go. <laughs> so it was did. incredible. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh... Alvarez hit the post as well, didn't he? Yeah. Haaland, one wide, one over the crossbar. Uh, you just know against City that they're going to create chance after chance, and that's exactly what they did. And to be honest, it was very reminiscent of uh, a week before Spurs in the first half against Villa. Yeah. She was on the other foot. Spurs, to be honest, should have been out of sight against Villa at half time. That wasn't the case. City should have also been out of sight against Spurs. Uh, didn't take the chances in, in the end, paid for it. The only thing I'd say was the difference as well is that against Villa, I felt Spurs played lovely football and created and carved out those chances. Whereas against City, you don't need to help City out. You know, they've got enough talent to be able to create those kind of chances themselves. But Spurs just kept giving the ball, whether it was the two main culprits for me, and I'm going to probably talk about them as this goes on, but... Isbasuma and Emerson Royale just were on a mission to give the ball to City. Um, I understand, you know, they've got to they've got to play this kind of football that's going to try and pass around the opposition, and it is terrifying at times to watch. But obviously, when it does work, it breaks the lines and it suddenly gives you loads of space behind the opposition. Um, and I felt that you had some players like Vicario. I remember saying this to you as the game wore on, how improved his passing has become. He just knows exactly where to pass it. Now, yeah, he's going to make the odd mistake. He made one where he had to then make a very big save. I think it was from Silva, wasn't it? It was. that. I mean, that was yeah. like 15, 20 seconds after the restart as well. Literally like a couple of minutes after Posta Coglu was angry message. Uh, yeah. But got away with it. Really, really good save. Yeah, but his his the ball with his at the ball at his feet, I think he's come on leaps and bounds. And then you've got someone like Emerson Real and he's Basuma who should be much, much better with the ball. And they were just so... They went kind of flip-flop from at times being really overly confident on the ball and thinking they had more time than they had to being really hesitant and not pushing it away to someone quickly. Um, because when Spurs' little triangles, they get them going, they are beautiful. There's so many times when they do this ball where the midfielder suddenly runs deep and hits a first-time ball out to the... Uh, whoever one of the centre-backs will knock it to the returning midfielder and he will knock it sideways suddenly into one of the full-backs' path. It's such a lovely move and it's so difficult to defend against. And suddenly you find that there's loads of space up the flank as well. But he just didn't do that enough in that first half. And like I say, you don't give um, City chances when they, they're they quite capable of doing that themselves. Um, I've actually got a little stat for you as well. On, uh, I was saying about Sonny there earlier being involved in everything. Sonny is the only the fifth player in Premier League history to record a goal, assist, and an own goal all in the same match. And one of the oh, uh, one of the other five was Gareth Bale, who did it for Spurs against Liverpool in 2012. Um, and he actually there's actually a little bit more history as well. He's only the second player in Premier League history to score a goal and an own goal in the opening ten minutes of the game. Gareth Bale did it. Uh, sorry, Gareth Barry did it twenty-four years ago. Yeah, I thought you were going to pull out the stat where I didn't saw it earlier. Son is the only player of summer to score uh, away from home against the reigning champions. Four different sides, like a completely random stat. They're just pulling anything up now. Oh, I've got but, more Sonny yeah. stats to come a bit later. Um, <laughs> and how, how many? How long do you think it was between his goal and the own goal? I don't know, to be honest, a couple of minutes, was it? Something like that. 137 seconds. Very close then. Just over, yeah. yeah. Almost two and a half minutes. Yeah, it was mad. I didn't realise how close they were together. Um, funny game. But no, I think he had a really good game. Like I say, I don't often go back to my play ratings and think, oh, I should have given this person higher or not. But I actually, on reflection, think I should have given Sonny another one. I gave him an eight. And looking at his contribution in the game, 
I think I said in my player ratings, I would have given him a nine, but for the own goal, which was unfortunate, but still is an own goal. Um, so maybe I have to stick to that. Maybe it'd be an 8.5, which we don't do. But uh, oh, it's just a crazy match. It really was. Yeah, uh, it wasn't like you said with those defensive errors at times. Uh, Emerson certainly guilty of one, giving it away uh, to the right of the area, which led to Haaland's uh, opportunity on goal that he you know, somehow put wide. I mean, someone with his, his record in front of goal, you'd have put your house on him scoring there, but he didn't take that uh, chance. And I think Emerson, yeah, there was some sloppy play from him at times, but I think he probably just got to understand as well that is a full-back trying to operate as a centre-back uh, at the moment. And he uh, he did contribute with some, you know, some good play at times, but it's just those errors. And I think there's one team you don't want to make those errors against. And it, it's City, but no, I think he's handled himself quite well on the whole, given it's a bit of an alien position to him in the past few games. But I think the good thing is now Christian Romero's back after that three-match suspension and, Fingers crossed he won't be suspended again for the rest of the season, but who knows? I'll tell you, if he gets another violent conduct one, it's four games, isn't it, next one, if you do yes. it twice? Yeah. Um, yeah. Again, I, I'm, I'm, I feel similar on Emerson that I feel like I have to criticise moments because it wasn't even just that Harlem one. When Alvarez hit the post, that was an Emerson uh, mistake, a loose pass that went to someone as well. And I think as a fullback the footwork and the use of the ball shouldn't be an issue. You know, that is something that he should be able to handle. But absolutely, I agree with you that he is playing in an, um, an unnatural role for himself. And, you know, look at some of his other stats to try and balance it up. And he made nine clearances and two tackles. So defensively, he did a lot of the, the tough work. And actually, I thought he was quite good in the air at times as well. But... It's almost the area that I expect him to be able to do better in because it doesn't really, you know, it's nothing to do with being a centre back. That was the area just in possession where I felt he messed up a little bit. What did you make of Ben Davies alongside him? I thought Davies did all right, you know. Uh, I think he's played well the past few games. Uh, one thing I did like about his performance yesterday was his role in the second goal, which I think is just going to get totally overlooked because it was a really, really good finish from Giovanni La Celso and uh, all came from Davis uh, winning the header against Haaland. I think there was only one winner when Davis, you know, put his body on the line to head the ball. I think it was probably about waist height for Haaland and straight into Son's path who teed up La Celso, uh, who then found the back of the net. I think Davis has done okay in the left-sided role and he's going to get an extended run in the team uh, with no Mickey van der Ven and I think he's probably just slowly going to go from strength to strength because, you know, we've seen him op operate as a left-sided centre-back in the three, slightly different in the two. Uh, but yeah, I, I think he's done okay, including yesterday at the Etihad. Yeah, like you say, I thought it was important for the second goal. I thought he showed really good anticipation and strength. It's no mean feat to get around Erling Haaland to be able to make that kind of intercepting header. And also, I saw some people criticising him for the second goal, which I thought was harsh. I watched it back. I really kind of slowed it down, paused it, kept playing it, just to kind of work out who was at fault. And from what I could see, he kind of had to make a move to Alvarez because he realised that Alvarez's run was easily beating the offside line that they'd set up. And so Davies attempts to get across. And then all of the midfielders, pretty much, are stuck in a line watching what's happening. Um, and that allows Foden to just ghost in behind uh, completely unmarked. So I, th I think that's very harsh. He was the only one that actually was alive to the danger. And Destiny Doggy makes a late run. He realises what's happened and just can't quite get across to Foden in time. So, yeah, I kind of felt that was everyone else being a bit switched off and um, and doing a really kind of an iffy line on the edge of the box that wasn't it wasn't good enough. Um, and I think Davies, alongside Romero, is going to be a completely different prospect to being alongside um, Emerson or Dyer because both of those players, I think Davies is having to do a lot of work in trying to cover certain aspects of their games as well. Whereas when Romero's there... He just gets to be a left-sided centre-back and he can focus on the left-hand side. He knows Romero is going to be kind of dominant and aggressive and hopefully not too aggressive. 
um, in his work. And I think you'll, I think we'll see in our player ratings, Davies getting a fair few decent marks in the weeks to come, I hope, um, because I think he can just focus on his own game, really. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't even pin the blame on Davies for that second one. I think it's just really good movement from Alvarez. It's a really, really impressive run, but no one's picked him up. And then because yeah. he's made that run, obviously you've got to try close him down. And then it's like Foden's just ghosted in as well. And good finish from him. But it was a good goal. Just, yeah, that's just City at the best. Uh, and they mm-hmm. can just do that in the blink of an eye. So, yeah, another decent performance uh, from Ben Davis. Someone you touched if on. If you want to be really critical, just, just very quickly. Again, well, I'm sorry to throw it at Emerson Royale again. But it was his kind of sliced clearance that then it didn't really go away very far and it was knocked back into the box. He tries to get a foot to it. And I remember at the time thinking, oh, that hasn't really gone very far. It kind of slices up into the air and I think it's headed back out wide to someone. Um, so, yeah, sorry. That was just a bash. I didn't mean to just bash <laughs> Everson again. But I think we're just showing that, yeah, the defence is very much a makeshift thing at the moment. Yeah, uh, what I was going to say was one player who you touched on a few minutes ago is Yves Basuma. Back yeah. in the team after his one-match ban uh, for picking up five yellow cards, the fifth one coming in the defeat at Wolves at the start of November. What did you make of his performance then yesterday? Oh, I feel like we're chucking all the negatives at people quite early in this. <laughs> we, I should stress, we're going to talk <laughs> with lots of positives we're going to talk about to come in the rest of this podcast. But yeah, Basuma, for me, he hasn't looked the same. Uh, we've said it before, he hasn't looked the same since the red card at Kenilworth, Kenilworth Road. He just hasn't. And it was the first time that Ange kind of admitted that, really. Um, George Sessions from PA asked him uh, ahead of the game about kind of his form. Um, and he just and said he just feels he's just been so fragmented. I think the, the football he's had in recent weeks, obviously he's missed the two games through suspension. Um, and he thinks just maybe... It's played on his mind. Um, and yeah, look, hey, not to kind of toot my own horn or anything, but I did ask the question a fair while back. I said to Ange, are you worried about Eves? Because he is picking up a lot of yellow cards in a quick amount of time. Um, and he was like, no, 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 no. That's just the position he plays. You know, that that's, that's, what, that's what's going to happen. And then on Friday, he's going on about, oh, you know, hopefully he'll learn now about the discipline. That's something that's let him down this season. I think I said that to you months ago. <laughs> I think that was when he was, he was either on three or four yellow cards at that point. I can't remember. But um, yeah, it's a shame because I think the main kind of aspect of it is so disappointing is how good Basuma was. You know, those first, whatever it was, eight, nine games or so, before, uh, I'm trying to think how many it would have been before the Luton game. He was so dominant. and everything good that Spurs did was kind of driven with him at the foundation of it and pushing them up the pitch, dribbling past players like they weren't there. You know, there was a touch of the Moussa Dembele about him and the way he was playing. And I just feel like ever since his confidence has been knocked and I think we saw that yesterday at the Etihad. There was the moment for the third goal was just ridiculous. He, He got away with it to begin with. He went into a position that he really shouldn't have come away with the ball in got it, and then for some unknown reason turned back into that dangerous area of the pitch, went into three City players who were all in a bundle, gave the ball to them, and it's worked up quickly, and obviously Grealish scores. Um, and that trouble is, is Postal Cogley made this clear of Basuma at the start of the season. He wants him to be a bit of a leading figure. He wants him to be someone that inspires everyone else on the pitch. So you don't want one of your leading lights, really, to be just messing about with the ball unnecessarily I mean it's fine if you're going to do a turn you're going to come away with it and I get that but he needs Basuma to be quickly building the play and using it well and he just hasn't quite done that and you know I said this way back even when he was playing well that one thing about Basuma unfortunately is that sometimes he switches off when he's meant to be tracking back and you see him kind of meandering quite slowly backwards and I think that's even more noticeable when the rest of his game isn't quite up to the same standard as it has been so, yeah, he's a guy that um, needs to improve, I think. Needs to get back. Needs a bit of a... I'm sure that Angel put his arm around his shoulder. I mean, would you... Is a question to you. Would you go as far to take him out for Hoybier? Or is this the kind of p- the scenario where you really you have to stick with him and just kind of build his confidence back up? Uh, well, I think Angel said in his pre-match press conference that 
it really has been like a disrupted period for yeah. Bissimit. Pretty much has been stop start because he got the red at Luton, so missed the following game, then ended up getting the ban uh, after the Wolves game and missing out against Villa. So you're now into a period in terms of probably trying to get him back to his best. You've got a good run of fixtures coming up. Fixtures are starting to pile up a bit now. It's the festive period. So I'd probably say that's what he needs, uh, just the game time, uh, just because he's not had it in recent weeks to try and get back to his previous levels that he you know, demonstrated in the first two months of the season because he was fantastic. But what I would say is, is... Is he uh, guaranteed a place in the team now as he previously was? I know there's a couple of issues in midfield with Madison and Benton Kerr missing, but Lacelso and Kulaseski have really stepped it up in their new midfield roles in recent weeks. And Pat Matasa potentially coming back by the end of the week. So could you be in a position where it's Sar starting with Lacelso and Kulaseski if Basuma's form's not there? I don't know if that's maybe a bit too attacking. Uh, I, I I don't know, but it's a good I th- shout. I mean, he has played defense uh, defensive midfielder saw before. He has. Yeah. It's yeah. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, personally, only very quickly. I think Postecoglou saw in Basuma a player who was the perfect fulcrum for his number six. Really, personally, I think he'll stick with him and, like you say, get his rhythm back and, and get his game time back in his legs again. I think he's only played like three matches in about eight weeks, something like that. It's not many. Yeah, I think it is. I think it's just the game time he needs. And obviously it's been a bit chopping and changing uh, recent weeks at Spurs. I mean, I don't think he's played alongside La Celso and Kulaseski as he in the midfield three. So that's a new no. combination for him. So that might have played a part. Uh yeah, I think it's just, as you said, it's just the match rhythm, just getting those regular minutes back in the tank. And if Spurs can get him back to the levels he displayed in the opening few games of the season, then even if they are missing Madison and Benteke, they kind of have some midfield on the hand. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm so excited about kind of the way that Kulisevsky is developing in the deeper role. I'm really excited about the way that the Celso is finally showing what we know he's capable of. Um, I think for him, it would just be the consistency now and staying fit. And like you say, I, that would be my thing about Saar, is that I don't know whether Saar is quite... Oh, it sounds really patronising, but I don't know whether he's experienced enough and mature enough yet to play what needs to be a very um, kind of fulcrum role in between those two quite yet. I'm not, I have no doubt that he's going to be that kind of player. Um, but I just think for now, I think Basuma, I think, yeah, I think Postacoglu will keep facing him. And uh, he is that kind of player that needs that bit of love, doesn't he? He needs an arm around the shoulder. He needs to be told, look, no, you're our man. You're going to kind of make things tick in the middle of the pitch. We just need you to get back into the swing of things. And uh, it's harsh on on Hoybier, but I just feel like Hoybier doesn't have the same attributes that Basuma does for the Postacoglu way. Um, although saying that, with two games in three game, uh, three days coming up, this week, I think you'll probably see either they alternate the two of those, one in starts one match and one starts the next, or, you know, at least Basuma, uh, sorry, Hoibia will start one of those games. Yeah. Uh, before we move on to the second half, Ali, do you want to let everyone know about the benefits of using NordVPN? Of course, yeah. If you're not aware by now, the Golden Guest Talk Tottenham podcast is sponsored by NordVPN and you can use the service in a host of different ways to enhance your internet experience. NordVPN is the fastest VPN in the world and that means no buffering, no lagging and you can stream your favourite shows from anywhere in the world without your bandwidth throttling. It's something I've done through work over the many years having used Nord way before they came on board with the podcast. I've used it just on holidays. I've used it just to be able to watch TV shows, movies, sports, whatever that I would normally watch back home, but for some reason those pesky kind of foreign boundaries stop you just doing it normally. But Nord allows you to switch your device to thinking it's still back home even when you're abroad, so you can just watch things. Um, And also there's added security element. It helps you if you're using public Wi-Fi and you don't want those nasty people getting into your devices and taking things off of them. Um, and not only that, but the outline on NordVPN subscription is cheaper for you in the long run. And that's because you can purchase streaming services or bookings from other countries at a much cheaper rate. 
So, for example, you could book flights from another country, and that could be cheaper too. So it means you're paying out for Nord, but you're saving money overall. There's a whole host of other benefits from signing up to NordVPN, so why not give it a go? You can grab the exclusive NordVPN deal by going to nordvpn.com forward slash gold guest to get a huge discount off your NordVPN plan, plus four additional months for free. It's completely risk-free with Nord's 30-day money-back guarantee. Right, let's move on to the second half, which was a much, much better performance from Spurs after the first half where, obviously, the Gifford City number of chances on goal and, like you said at the start of the podcast, perhaps a tad lucky just to go in 2-1 down at the break. Uh, we spoke with Dan Kulaseski after the game in the mix zone and he was saying Ange was very angry uh, with the Tottenham players at halftime and he made his points quite clear to them. Uh, so what did Kulaseski say? Uh, what did Ange say? Right, basically was, he said to us, we have to start playing. That it's not good enough and we were afraid. We always say, don't be afraid, but we didn't play well enough. Came out for the second half and thought, what happens, happens, just play. And we did better. They were certainly better in the second half. Yeah, they were. It, it was interesting because he did sound, I, li- I listened to, he kind of said something along the same lines to, on his uh, club interview as well. I was quite surprised that he was like, I've never seen him that angry before. But from everything kind of heard, during that um, the preseason game against Shakhtar, apparently he went absolutely yeah. ballistic at halftime in that game as well. I'm trying to think, Kuzeski did play, didn't he, in that game? I, I assume like so. Yeah, I'm pretty I, sure I don't he think he'll have been missing for that one. Uh, no, I'm pretty sure. I've yeah. got a feeling he set up one or two of the uh, the Kane goals as well. But um, yeah, so they have kind of have seen this before where he's read the riot act at half time. But hey, it, it did the job. They responded. Uh, their play was so much better, especially from the back as well. And Kudasevsky in his club interview kind of praised Vicario in the defence for just moving the ball quite quickly from that point on out to um, the attacking players. And, I mean, Decky himself, he's just... I, I just don't get it when people criticise him because I just feel like they forget he is 23 years old. Um, it's just ridiculous how much he kind of does for the team and how much... he Just the running... I'm tired just watching him in the first 10 minutes, let alone when he's still doing, you know, that run that he had to do to score the uh, the equalising goal right at the end. Even that showed the kind of the ability to get out of the pitch. And having watched it back a few times, um, we know he's not one. That's the only th- one of the things I would say about him as well. For a guy that's really strong and tall, he doesn't really do much in the air. And watching it back, it's very much a header from someone that doesn't do much, do many headers. It kind of half comes off his shoulder and his head, but it's one of those beautiful things in football, not for City, obviously, that that was the best possible way to get it with the ball to send it onto the crossbar and in. Um, it really was. I think he said in, I think it was his Sky interview or something. He said he hasn't even watched the goal back at that point. He didn't know how it went into the net. I think when he watches it back, he'll realise it was a, it was a hefty amount of shoulder as well as the side of his head. But um, yeah, I mean, Postecoglou said he was excellent throughout the whole game, um, and we can count on him attacking the box from that side. And he said him and Brennan Johnson have goals in them. We haven't had enough out of them yet, but they are there, and it's great those two combined for a great goal at the end. Um, yeah, I just. I mean, I had his stats here because obviously he scored now the last three games. His, 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 every game he's played at the Etihad, all three games, hasn't he? He's scored in them. Scored his first goal for Spurs there as well. But I was looking up in 62 Premier League appearances, he's got 11 goals and 16 assists. So that means he's got a goal involvement in almost every other game he's played in the Premier League. I mean, he's 23. <laughs> How do people complain about Dejan Kulisewski? I just think it's insane. I just think he's such a good player. Um, yeah, he's got things he needs to uh, work on. I mean, he and Lacelso might be the two probably most left-footed players you'll ever see in your life. Lacelso even more so. You know, I think uh, you know if you, uh, I think I think you said it, didn't you? That essentially his right foot is just there for kind of balancing on. <laughs> he doesn't really yeah. use it for anything else. But Decky can, you know, he needs to get away from being a little bit predictable and cutting inside. Um, and I guess that's what helps him. When he's playing that little bit deeper, he could go either way with his runs. Um, and yes, he can be more clinical, I think, at times. 
But overall, he's an incredible young player, and I think he's only going to get better and better. And, and Postacoglu loves him because he knows how much work he does. And I mean, likewise, I get the impression that Kuliszewski loves Postacoglu. He loves his old ethos. He loves the way he looks at the game. He keeps calling it fun, doesn't he? He just loves the kind of the the enjoyment of it all. Um, yeah, Kuliszewski for me, he, he's on a a real kind of upward curve again at the moment, which I think is terrific. Um, I I think I always judge how good a player is by if you took him out the team, is the team poorer for it? And I think with Kuzowski, it's always the case. When he doesn't play, they don't look as effective because um, he brings so much off the ball, just almost as much as he does on the ball. So, um, yeah, and I was I was very pleased with Kuzowski as well. What did you make of um, Brennan Johnson? Uh, he did it okay. Uh, we've certainly not seen the best of him since his move uh, from Forest. Like Basuma, it's been a bit of a stop-start period for him recently. Uh, Johnson's had those injuries. The free international breaks haven't helped his uh, cause as well in terms of getting a bit of match rhythm. Uh, I thought he did okay. I think he had one decent run in the first half down the right which City I think it was Diaz uh, wasn't that far off from putting the ball into his own yeah. net a lovely Poro ball I think wasn't it yeah uh, contributed when it mattered most though uh, in the dying minutes good run down the left flank and uh, a good cross to Kulisewski who more than uh, definitely deserved uh, a goal for his performance yesterday there was only one winner as soon as he went up in the air and you know Nathan yeah. Aki's a uh, a good defender, but he had no chance of winning that header as soon as uh, Kulisewski rose. Uh, I've been impressed with Kulisewski. Uh Past two games, he just looks more like himself in the number 10 role. And he said after the last game against Villa that, you know, seeing like the best version of him uh, playing there. And I think he's only going to go from strength to strength and get even better. I don't think we've seen the best of him yet. Uh, I did mention to you yesterday during the game, like, Kulisewski would just fit in perfectly at City. Typical Guardiola play, like really good on the ball, got all the qualities. Uh, I, they look you, though. I didn't want any City <laughs> officials to hear that. <laughs> but the good thing is, he's a Tottenham player. And I think last season was probably, you just wanted a bit more consistency from him because, I mean, his start to his Tottenham career was absolutely incredible. Was it five goals, eight assists in about... 17 games and last season yeah. started off okay with the numbers. I think Southampton on the opening day he might have scored and got an assist, but those numbers pretty much tailed off over the course of the season. I think he got, he got an injury, didn't he? Yeah, and in the World Cup, I think he did. It wasn't great after the World Cup, no. Uh, but now he's got a manager at the club whose football philosophy he absolutely loves. But I think that's the case for everyone at Spurs because. You want to play that attacking football, like and says when you're growing up, that's what you do. It's just attack, 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 and uh, that's what they're doing. Not sure, Eric Dyer loves it. No, no, I don't <laughs> think so. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I think just Ange's mentality, his football philosophy, and his approach, it just suits Kulisewski down to the ground. And we're starting to see the best of him once again. And I think he's just going to be a pivotal figure for the team in the coming weeks and months. Absolutely. And just very quickly on Brennan Johnson, I think his pace is going to be such an asset for Spurs. Yeah. It's honest, it's lightning. I didn't realise how quick he was. And the good thing is, as well, having just recently had a hamstring injury, he's not affected him. He's absolutely kind of opening his legs and just going. Um, and the cross as well for Kuzeski was a left footed cross, wasn't it? It was. It so, was. Showing his ability with both feet there. Um, and like we said earlier, absolutely kind of stripping walk of a pace. So, yeah, I think and the beauty of him being able to play on the right or left is very important as well. Um, that gives Postokoglu as many options as he can have right now in his kind of stricken side. But no, I thought it was good. And as I said earlier, I thought Sonny through the middle was superb. Um, definitely reevaluated him slightly on watching some of the big moments in the game. Um, he's just such an experienced player now. He's such a wise head. He's a good captain. And another little Sonny stat that I did say I was coming up with, um, that was his 50th Premier League away goal, which 
which makes him just the, se the seventh different player to score at least 50 home goals, 50 away goals, and provide 50 assists in the Premier League. The first person to ever do that at Tottenham, apparently. Impressive. That's, that's mad, isn't it? I'm surprised Kane didn't manage to get there, but maybe Kane didn't get to 50 assists. I know he had that season when he was flying with the assists, but probably didn't get 50 overall. Um, yeah, honestly, what a player he is. Um, I think they, they need to sort out that new contract for Sonny. Pretty sharpish, I think. Get that get that tied up. I think that would be another big kind of thing for Spurs going forward. Yeah. Just going back to Johnson quickly, I think how mm. he's going to be used at the club. I think we saw it against Villa. The amount of times, you know, Porro put a ball over the top with Villa playing the high line. Yeah. Just how many times they got in behind. And it's just literally Johnson uses his pace puts it across the goal and you've got Sonny or someone else waiting there. I think it's a really, really good weapon to have. And I think he just needs a run of games now, just a bit of consistency. Uh, yeah, I think he's going to be another one who can be key for Ange Postacoglu's team uh, going forward. Right then, uh, I think we need to speak about Giovanni Lo Celso. We obviously, we said about a minute ago, the player who's extremely one-footed. Uh, but chips in again, two goals in the last two games. Are you saying now he's repaid his huge transfer fee? <laughs> quite. We're not quite there. It's probably, it's probably paid off about, um, I don't know, 500 grand of it. One but um, it. <laughs> yeah, he's actually very quickly back on Son. Watch Son's dummy run. For La Celso to score. Son takes and absolutely rips that defence across with him. And it leaves that space for La Celso to run into. And it was one of those where you just kind of, you expected him to put it in the net. Which is weird for a player that you obviously don't know for, like, that's going to score so many goals. But you knew he was kind of confident. And he's got that ability to just bend the shot. Um, yeah, he uh, was very good. Um, Postoglu said... Um, after the game, that he was one of the players that really stood up in the second half for Spurs and really kind of showed what he can do. And I mean, we've said it before, if you can get Lo Celso firing, he's the perfect combo of creativity and aggression, really. He's just got a little bit of everything. And this could be his moment, you know, but he's got to stay fit. If he can stay fit, Madison being out opens the door for him now to have a run of games until, you know, Madison's potentially not till later in January is, is kind of expected back or at least expected to be fit enough to be really be starting games again. So that gives Lo Celso a good almost two months of football to, to get himself kind of properly nestled in this team. Um, I was looking back, he's only made 89 appearances across four and a half years at Tottenham. Um, obviously, it was away for 18 months or so of that on loan. And I think injuries have played their part as well. But when he does, when you get him into kind of good positions, he normally comes up with something. He's got nine goals now and six assists. He's kind of, we know it should be more for four and a half years at a club. But in terms of, you know, getting him to those positions, he can do it. Um, and it was, it was a lovely goal. Um, and he was a little bit... Uh, I mean, you used the the term before we came in and recording this, that lamellaresque quality of just winding people up entirely. And there's a little moment after the full-time whistle as well, wasn't there? Yeah, there was. Obviously, I think one of the main talking points today, absolutely huge, is uh, Simon Hooper, the referee, uh, blowing the whistle after Haaland had been fouled and then he'd subsequently played the ball over the top for Jack Grealish and the refs pulled the play back. Haaland after the game, not happy at all. He's walking off. Lo Celso, who had come off with probably about 15, 20 minutes to go, he's got his yeah. Spurs tracksuit on. He's walking on the pitch, bumps into Haaland. I don't know if it's a bit 50-50 or Lo Celso makes a little, tiny bit of a beeline to him just to make a bit of contact with him. Clearly riles Haaland up. Lo Celso must say something to him. Uh, yeah. And then Haaland turns back and then it's Brendan Johnson who, you know, speeds in to try to split him up and Posta Coglu uh, there as well. Like I said to you before we start the pod, it's very similar to something you'd expect Eric Lamella or uh, Christian Romero, one of his fellow Argentine players to do. Uh, but Lo Celso's got that fight in him. You see it on it the pitch. He does. Yeah. He really does. He's, 
yeah, it's good to see him no contributing for Spurs again because, I mean, it's mad. It's his fifth season at the club. And, you know, we've barely seen him get a consistent run and just hit the heights like he has done uh, in Spain when he's been at Real Betis and Villarreal. Yeah, well, at least he's putting to bed the debate over who is the biggest flop, him or Tondi. <laughs> at, least, at least that now is, you know, that's settled. I don't think we can... Uh, I mean, he scored a, before against City as well, hasn't he? He's, he's, he uh, he's got a little bit... All three players that scored yesterday have, have a little bit of a history of scoring against City. I've watched that little clip back from after the game now so many times. Uh, only in the last, you know, 20 minutes before we even came on air to do this. And I still can't work out exactly how it plays out. I think because Haaland seems to be shaking hands with a couple of people as he comes off. And he comes towards Lo Celso. And I can't tell whether Lo Celso is disappointed that Haaland isn't really trying to shake his hand. So he doesn't bother to even take his hand out of his pocket or whether he genuinely does kind of try and give him a bit of a nudge to see what reaction he gets. Um, you know, you would think probably the way he plays, it's the latter. Um, but I think we touched on it. We probably can't avoid it too much, although I have an opinion on it. That moment when the ball was called back that caused all of those issues right near the end. So in case you missed it, essentially Emerson Royal goes in for a bit of a late lunge on Haaland. The referee appears to say, Let's play on. Don't worry, play on. And then as soon as the ball is knocked forward to Grealish, and Grealish is kind of running on, he calls the play back and, and blows his whistle. It was a bizarre bit of officiating. I've got no issue whatsoever with the fact that it was a strange bit of refereeing. I think City could be annoyed at the refereeing moment itself. The issue that I more have with the big controversy and kind of, kind of hoopla about it all is that Jack Grealish is not the fastest. And for me, by the time that whistle was blown, Ben Davies had already caught up with him. Um, and he was not like on the edge of the Spurs box. He was about halfway into the half. And I feel like it wasn't the clear cut he's through on goal that it's almost being made out to be. And there's a part of me that wonders, did, I mean, I don't know if we'll find out or not, whether the referee has seen that Davies has caught up with him and thinks, okay, it's not like it's not going to result in something. Maybe I'll call it back now. I don't know. But yeah, yeah, I get the annoyance about the strange refereeing nature of it, but I don't get the kind of feeling that City have been robbed of this amazing chance to win the game. Yeah, don't get me wrong. Grealish could have shaken off Davies, I guess, and, and somehow still got a fair way on to then score. But yeah, I, I'm not quite as convinced. It was if I'd say that City had a lot other, lot more other moments that they could have won that game in than that kind of one towards the end. And uh, even Postecoglou was quite dismissive of it when he was asked at the end. He was like, "If we're going to reduce that amazing match to that moment, then I think there's something wrong." What do you make of it? Uh, it's just a bad mistake, isn't it, from the ref? I mean, you'd be. Mm fuming if it happened uh, to your team and I don't know if it's just one of these where he thinks Haaland's over hit the ball he's not going to get it or blow up but I think Davis probably might have caught up with him you don't know how that situation is going to pan out whether Davis brings Grealish down and they get a free kick on the edge of the box Grealish runs on and scores you just don't know all we know is he's been denied that opportunity you know to take uh, a chance on goal. Uh, but let's be honest, City should have been home and dry in the first half. They've had more than enough chances to put the game to bed. And like Ange says, why reduce such a good game down to one moment? Uh, I think Harlan was annoyed with his own performance more than anything. And using that as like to, a way to kind of vent his frustration. Maybe, but I think you're just going to be so, so angry in that situation when you put a really good mm. ball over the top and your play is through on goal and the referees obviously brought it back. Uh, yeah, not a good one at all. No, no. Another one, I think, to add to the list of weird <laughs> refereeing moments in uh, in Spurs games as well, especially. Um yeah, but I just, I don't know. I think that's probably why we haven't kind of led on that like a lot of other people have like chucked it straight at the top of the podcast because I still don't think it was a defining moment in the game at all. I think it was just 
uh, yeah, like a, an odd moment, if that at all. Yeah, yeah, most definitely. I think what yesterday at the Etihad shows is Ange Postacoglu's approach just fully paid off. I know he was asked in his pre-match press conference whether it'd go maybe a tad more defensive uh, coming up against the attacking might of City also as well because Spurs had gone into the game on the back of three successive defeats. But he made it perfectly clear that they wouldn't compromise their principles. It would, as they always have this season, just go out and attack and... Yeah, they've come away with a point. So I think his approach has been fully vindicated and that's a victory for Coglu. Yeah, I think I think people kind of got a bit carried away, didn't they? They were like, they saw what happened against Chelsea with the nine men and the defending on the halfway yeah. line and they kind of thought, that's what Postacoglu does. It's like, no, not really. That was just a moment where he felt that was the best way to try to still get something with nine men. His football isn't just crazy you know, shoot yourself in the foot football. That's not how it works. And if anything, we saw that, that Spurs still with his mindset knew that they were going to have to, at times, sit back and counter. It's not saying that that was how they were set up to do it, but they just knew with the quality that City had, they were going to be pushed back at times. And it was about how quickly they could get that ball recycled into areas. Um, it's a far more adaptive kind of philosophy than people kind of think it is. Um and yeah, it did. I, I'd hope it put to bed a lot of the rubbish before the game about, you know, how's how's his game going to work against the top teams? I mean, you look at it and the Postacoglu way this season has brought draws away at Arsenal and City. It would have beaten Chelsea if they'd kept the men on the pitch. It was looking that way. Uh, it beat Man U. Um, which one am I forgetting? I feel like I'm forgetting another Liverpool. one. Liverpool. Liverpool. Yeah, yeah. Liverpool's a bit of a difficult one because of what happened in the game and which ways it could have gone. But ultimately, they got the three points. So, yeah, you look at the games that this, you know, crazy, gung-ho, naive, stubborn, whatever you people want to call it, philosophy, it's actually brought them a fair bit of success. Um, and, yeah, I think the thing that excites me the most about it is imagining what Spurs going to the Etihad with a full strength team playing the Postacoglu way would look like, I think they'd give them a hell of a game. I think that would, uh, they'd be far kind of better at the back in terms of keeping City out, yet be probably creating far more chances than, than they did yesterday. So, yeah, that's what excites me the most is this is just the beginning of the Postacoglu era. This is a Postacoglu philosophy kind of crowbarred into a team that it doesn't fit it entirely. It's uh, players playing out of position, yet they're still taking on board everything he's telling them. Um, and I think that is what excites me the most going forward about it. And yeah, I think it's just funny, this kind of idea. And we all do it. Don't get me wrong. We all do it as journalists and fans do it as well, of trying to tell a manager who's been a manager for 28 years or so, who has managed at World Cups, he's managed teams to titles in every different country he's been to. No, no, no. We know more than you. You can't bring that to our league. How's that going to work? And it's like, I think he probably knows how his football works and how it adapts and things like that. And uh, yeah, once again, um, kind of showed everyone, I think, what Spurs are going to be capable of. And uh, yeah, I'm quite excited to see where it goes. Yeah, I think Spurs at full strength and the football they displayed yesterday, if they can play, you know, to the absolute maximum, they're more than capable of beating anyone in this league, even home mm -hmm. and away, really. Uh, it's just such a shame that, you know, Christian Christian Romero, Mickey van der Ven, James Madison, yeah. Ben Kerr, Pat Matasau are missing yesterday because you just want to see full strength Tottenham go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Premier League's best. Let's be honest, the best team in the world. It's fine and, of the team, isn't it? Yeah, but, I think if they were at full strength yesterday, I think they might have won. I really do. The more than got it in them to be anyone in this league. And yeah, it's just a shame all these injuries have come at once. But I think we'll all be looking forward to the game at Tottenham Hotspur Stadium towards the back end of April. Hopefully things have cleared up on the injury front by then. Uh, but yeah, yeah, uh, lots and lots of positives once again to take from uh, Spurs' performance, even though they've not won the game. 
Yeah, I mean, second half of the season, if we're hoping that they've used up their bad luck in the first half of the um, season with the injuries, if they can keep a fairly fit core of their squad for the second half of the season, as that philosophy gets more and more embedded into everything they do, they're going to smash teams. They're going to sweep them aside. They really are. And add a couple of, you know, key additions in the um, January window. And it is honestly, Spurs fans should really be excited about what's happening. Um, especially, it's, it's like night and day to what, like, of what happened towards the end of last season. Um, it could be a very, very um, thrilling end to the season. But, you know, they've got to get there in one piece first. <laughs> the way they're going, you know. I mean, there's another injury technically. Eric Dyer um, wasn't available uh, for the game because he felt soreness after the final training session. So there's technically another player on the injury list there. Who knows what's to come in two games in uh, three days as well. They could pick up even more. So you've got to get through that first. Yeah, good to get Richie back though as well yesterday. I think we probably weren't expecting him to be back on the pitch so soon. Maybe for might be mid December. I mean, it's only yeah. been about what three and a half weeks since uh, undergoing surgery. So all that post- praying at the Richarlison Shrine that you do it helped, <laughs> didn't it? Yeah, it did. Uh, I'm sure you said to me yesterday at the game he changed the game when he came on the last five minutes. Uh, I don't think I said that. I think he. <laughs> He definitely gave them a little bit of a focal point. They were playing like four two four towards the end. Yeah, it, it was, uh, yeah. I mean, he, he. I guess he played his part. I wouldn't say changed the game, but he, he played his part. I don't know. He barely touched the ball, did he? I can't remember. What I can remember is him. What I've seen from all videos, he just booted the ball into the away end, didn't he? When Kulusevski scored. <laughs> yeah, he that doesn't count. That's not changing it. the game. <laughs> uh, but I mean. And said in his pre-match press conference that it'd only be five to ten minutes if required. It'd only yeah. be able to do. So it's just a case of building up his fitness, probably going to have to contend with a place on the bench for the next few games and just try, you know, work his way back into uh, the team. But at least it's a bit of a positive in terms of things maybe look like they're picking up on the injury front, even though there was the bad news about Eric Dyer's uh, mission from the squad yesterday. But and said as well, Pat Matasar by the end of the week, hopefully. And then it's just going to be from January onwards uh, when the rest of uh, the players are back. Another boost yesterday, or some good news, Jamie Donnelly making his uh, full Spurs debut. Didn't a number of... Supporters have been waiting quite a while uh, to see Donnelly make his senior bow, especially going on his terrific form for the club's youngsters so far this season. Maybe thought he might have come on in the recent games against Wolves and Villa uh, when Spurs have needed a goal. But that wasn't the case. But he got a couple of minutes to his name yesterday when he replaced Brendan Johnson. Again, I'm not sure if he touched the ball. I don't know, to be honest. But still, a really, really good moment. and. Hopefully, the first of many in the Tottenham shirt for him. I've got the stats for you. And do you know why? It's because I was looking up Richarlison for you. Both Richarlison... So, Richarlison got... How many was the injury times? About, added times? About five minutes? Five six minutes? Something like that, yeah, yeah. I think it was meant to be five. They ended up playing about six. So, in <laughs> ten minutes in all, Richarlison touched the ball twice. He didn't play a single pass. Um, he had one unsuccessful touch. So I don't know what happened with the other touch. <laughs> just, just the ball came to him and stopped. Um, and Jamie Donnelly in approximately about 60 seconds on the pitch also touched the ball twice. And one of those was winning an aerial duel. Right. That's okay. quite impressive. I don't, I don't actually remember that, to be fair. Um, but yeah, great moment, really terrific moment for him. Oh, and he, that was he made a clearance, that was why he must have won a, a header at the back. It's not work as well. Um, brilliant for Jamie Donnelly. It's brilliant for so many people that have played their part in his development over the years. You know, for the at the lower age group, Stuart Lewis as well, being his coach at that, those kind of age groups, and Wayne Burnett, obviously, for the under 21s this season, where he's just smashed it. It's kind of the debut we were all kind of expecting and waiting for. It was going to happen at some point, but it just felt like Postacoglu wasn't quite ready to throw him in. 
And to be fair, trusting him in the final minute or two, even though you're trying to waste time in a big situation like that against the champions, that's that's a nice pat on the back, I think, that he needs to take from that. That is a that is a big moment for him. And I do wonder whether, you know, not only do we look back on this game as one where, is this where the Postco glue era really kind of, they convince themselves that that second half, they can still play it and that it can be the way forward. But maybe we look back on it in years to come and think that was the the day when it all started for Jamie Donnelly. That would be brilliant. I mean, he's still obviously got a is a long way to go. That is just the very first step of a very very long road. Um, but he's a very talented player. He is Spurs through and through. His family are Spurs through and through. England under nineteen international, mainly a forward, but has been kind of been playing in a an attacking midfield role this season. And, I mean, his stats are ridiculous. I've got them here somewhere. Um, he has got... Let me read out his numbers for you. He's got 11 assists and six goals in 12 games in the Premier League 2 in EFL Trophy this season. I think he's got more in the Premier League Cup as well. Um, a hell of a young player. Um Really highly rated around the club. They gave him a, a decent new deal, I think. Was it earlier this year? He got that as well. Um, yeah, it's, I mean, that bench, if you look at it yesterday, it had Donnelly, it had Dorrington, it had Iago Santiago back from injury to be on there as well. Uh, Valise, obviously, he's only, is he 19? Is he 20 yet? Maybe turned 20 recently. I think he might have. Something like uh, that, yeah. Yeah. It's uh, it was a very young bench, and even Skippy. Um, you know, we haven't even mentioned the fact that he came on and had a nice little cameo as well. He came on, lovely little turn and pass for that third goal. Actually, sorry, we did mention that briefly, didn't we? But yeah, he um, he had a nice little involvement as well. But for Donnelly, again, I always feel that with these academy kind of debuts, it's as much the players done all obviously a lot of hard work themselves to get to that point, but it's also about all those people along the pathway that have helped them get to that role because it's not easy. <laughs> people kind of just assume that, oh, if you're talented, you're going to make it. It does not work like that. I, you know, my background way back was covering non-league and league two football. I've seen so many players that have dropped out of academies at various Premier League clubs that went on to play at those lower levels thought they were the greatest thing that the world has ever gifted to the game, even at that level. Um, and they just sunk into obscurity. Even even then, they couldn't kind of deal with the football at that level. So it doesn't matter how talented you are. There's so much more. You've got to have the mental side of it, the perseverance, the determination, the sacrifice you have to make as well with your personal life, you know, not going out with your mates and having a laugh and having beers and all that sort of stuff. And and Jamie Donnelly is, has made that. It feels like it's the end goal, but it's not. It's really weird. Like the end goal of everything he's done in the academy to get to this point, but yet it's only opening the door, I guess, to a whole new long part of the journey that he's then got to step on. And uh, I've got kind of high hopes for Jamie Donnelly. He's got the temperament and he's got the ability. Um, and if he gets a few minutes here and there, because the injuries aren't, like you say, the injuries are going to start to clear up a little bit in terms of. Romero back from his suspension. Saar back by the end of the week. Um, even Ryan Sessegnon, thankfully, is only about a couple of weeks away from being involved in group training. But they're going to take it very carefully with him because he's um, obviously this is meant to be the surgery that hopefully, fingers crossed, um, touch wood as well, um, ends his hamstring hell. But so he's on his way back as well. Richardson obviously back now and finally free of... Um, <laughs> His pubic pain, <laughs> I don't know how do I to say it? His pubic bone pain. Um, one of the most unfortunate injuries I guess you could probably have. Um, an unrestricted Richarlison. But I think there's still chances for the likes of Jamie Donnelly, as long as he can realise, and I'm sure he does, that he hasn't made it yet. He's got to keep trying to impress Postacoglu now in training as well. Yeah, I'm hoping he gets more minutes in the weeks ahead. Yeah. Some of the news from yesterday, it was the FA Cup third round draw. Uh, Spurs enter the competition weekend of Saturday, January 6th, and they've got a home game against Burnley. Uh, I don't think you can have too many grumbles about the cup draw. You want a winnable game at home. I think Spurs have that. 
let's be honest, Burnley have bigger fish to fry uh, this season. Their priority is quite clearly keeping themselves in in the Premier League. Yeah, I think it's one of these where touch wood, Spurs will be in the hat for the fourth round draw. But again, it's one of these, don't rest on your laurels. You're going to have to be at your best. And after that first round exit in the Carabao Cup away at Fulham back in August, as well as no European football on the agenda this year, I think everyone associated with Tottenham just wants to see Ange Postacoglu's team have a really good crack at the FA Cup. That's, I mean, look at the draw. One of Arsenal or Liverpool are getting knocked out because they're playing each other in the third round and there might be a couple more uh, ties like that along the way. Uh, we've seen what Spurs have done in the league so far this season. There's no reason why Spurs can't get to Wembley this year. Just just need to, uh, like I said, have a really good crack at it. They do. Yeah, it, it's a decent draw. I mean, like you say, Spurs can never look too far ahead. I mean, they almost messed up against Morecambe at home. So, <laughs> so like, And no disrespect to Morecambe, but Spurs should be beating them comfortably at home. Portsmouth um, was a bit touch and go last year Portsmouth. as well. That one, one nil. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, then and that is lost away at Sheffield United and Middlesbrough. So, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It, it, Tottenham, Tottenham are quite capable of messing these things up. <laughs> but yeah, it's one of those where I guess you'll have a few more bodies back. If anyone becomes like is, is slightly ahead of schedule, you might have people back that little bit earlier, perhaps. But then I guess Postecoglou probably looks at that also. Is 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 a chance with that and the little winter break that they have as well, it's a chance for some of those injured players to not rush back as quickly as possible. They can take their time and make sure they're absolutely ready. I mean, you know, Mickey van der Ven, especially with the hamstring and his pace, you want him to be absolutely at full kind of speed and ready to go uh, rather than coming back and any potential that he could do the same thing again very quickly. But yeah, Burnley at home, I'll take that. It's far better than going to Burnley. Um, and that's purely said because of my history of having to go to Turf Moor and oh, especially that snowed off game. But anyone that knows uh, my my tale of that game, I don't need to tell that one again. Um, yeah, I'll take that. It's like you say, there's some big games in that. The the Arsenal Liverpool one and the Sunderland Newcastle's a cracker. That's such a good game. Um Jack Clark hopefully uh going to show what he can continue to do in that game as well so yeah we'll see we'll 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 kind of come back we'll put a pin in that come back to that in january um but it should be a it should be a game that uh barring any more injury i mean it might be an academy 11 by the time they get there <laughs> who knows the way Spurs injuries are going we might be talking about jamie Dodley as a like captain or something at that point but um yeah and i'm happy enough with that draw yeah, plenty of games on the agenda prior to then. Uh, two this week, West Ham at home on Thursday and then Newcastle United at home on Sunday in the forfeit to kick off. Uh, two big games as Spurs look to bounce back to winning ways, but I think they can take a lot of positives from uh, yesterday's game at the Etihad Stadium. And if everything comes together and Spurs you know, play like they have been in the past couple of games, Chances are going to be there, just need to take them. And hopefully on the next podcast, we will be talking about Spurs uh, winning games again. Good that Christian Romero has gone to be back though, isn't it? It is. What team would you start with? Uh, Vicario, Porro, Romero, Davis, Doggy, uh, I, I don't know about Basuma or Hoybjerg. But Lacelso, Kulisevsky, and I don't <laughs> it's know. It's difficult, isn't it? Do you give Brian Hill another goal uh, in attack? It's I too soon for Richarlison to start, so it's either either move Kulisevsky into the front three and bring Hoybjerg in. I don't know. I think probably nine of the eleven picks itself. Just question marks over another two positions. Yeah, I think it's one of those. I think you have to reward Hoybier. Yeah. I think I think Kudasevsky pushes up. Um, despite the fact that I really like him in that deeper role, but I think you, you push him up. Um and I think Lacelso 
on the edge. Lo Celso on the side of a Basuma Hoybier trio adds that little bit of creativity. It stops it becoming too uh, safe, I guess. I mean, was it? It was. They ended the game, didn't they? With it was Skip Basuma and Hoybier last night, which was the Wolves. Was that no? No, it wasn't the Wolves. I'm Skip didn't play. Who played the Wolves? Basu. Basuma, Hoybier. And uh, was it Sa? Sa, yeah. Benton yes. Kerr was sub on and came on for Sa. Yeah, that was it. Yes. So I think La Celso gives you a little bit more of an attacking edge. It's not quite three players who are more, uh, not defensively inclined, but less attack minded, I guess is the way to put it. Um, so maybe you go with that. Um, yeah, who knows? Who knows, maybe at home he feels like Brian Hill could do what he they did against Villa and, and then he has more of an effect in that. I mean, it's going to be a, a difficult kind of derby. You know, West Ham, you know, David Moyes is going to target the, um, the set pieces with the height, but I guess you've got Romero back, so that's a big thing. Um, just hope Romero doesn't get himself wound up in a derby as well. I'm sure they'll target him in that respect. I think the good thing, in a way, about the game three days later against Newcastle is that ordinarily you'd think, oh, crikey, Spurs have got so few players to have to play that game again so quickly. Newcastle in quite a similar position. Newcastle, are re- I think Newcastle might even have 14 players injured. I'm sure I saw that number chucked about the weekend. Um, and they've got a toughish game. Um, <laughs> no, it's quite a tough game. Aren't they playing at Everton? Uh, they are. Our home record's dreadful so far this season. Oh, so that ruined I'm, that for me. But all in all, our form at the moment is pretty good, uh, even though we're in the bottom three because of uh, that, decision. Uh, that decision. But what I would say in terms of Newcastle, they have a really, really important game a few days after the Spurs one. They've got Milan at home in the Champions League and need to win it uh, to potentially go through if results go their way. But I think even if not, they can get Europa League. I think it's in their hands. So maybe they have one eye on that game. When does, is that when, Tuesday or Wednesday? It'll We're be the Wednesday. It'll be uh, it'll be it'll be Wednesday if it's a Sunday game. It won't be right. playing Sunday Tuesday. No, that would be too much of a turnaround, <laughs> wouldn't it? Um, okay, that's interesting. Yeah, so that is a really packed week for them. That's going to stretch their squad to the kind of limit. So yeah, especially with Spurs at home as well. Maybe that is what they need. It don't take anything away from it. It's still going to be an incredibly tough game, but I think it hopefully balances out the tiredness aspect for Tottenham. Um, and like I said, if you've got Romero and Saar coming in there with fr- fresher legs as well, Richarlison maybe by the time the Newcastle game comes around able to play maybe an hour. It depends how far he's kind of got into his fitness work. Um, yeah, I'm uh, intrigued to see how this week goes, but they've got to harness all the positive momentum from that match bit, uh, last night because if you can go to Man City, regardless of kind of what happened during the game and come away with a point, with an understrength team, you've got to harness the good feelings from that. And uh, I know it's a cliche, but trust the process because the Postacoglu process is certainly working right now. It is. Big week coming up, as we've said on this podcast today, a number of positives uh, from the Etihad. Now it's just about taking it forward and getting Spurs back to winning ways. So we'll call it a day on today's podcast and we'll be back probably next week or maybe end of this week i don't know yeah we'll we'll see how we play this because just to let people know if you're not aware it's an absolutely packed week you've got a postacoglu press conference on wednesday match on thursday postacoglu decided he's going to do a pre-match for newcastle press conference on friday Uh, then you've got the saturday off then we've got the sunday that's the match so postacoglu if you're including post-match press conferences has got four press conferences in five days uh, he's going to be utterly sick of the sight of my stupid face in front of him. Um, so, yeah, when we're actually going to fit in a podcast, it might be that we have to kind of double up with the two matches just purely because I don't know when we're going to fit in a, a one after the West Ham game. Um, we'll figure it out. We'll think of something. Yeah, so it could be a bumper di- edition on Monday a then. three-hour podcast. <laughs> <laughs> not, not that long. <laughs> no, not that long. No, I think no. we'd lose a lot of people if we did that. Yeah. 
Right, we'll call it a day then on today's podcast as ever. Just keep with us at football.london for all your latest Tottenham news. To get to grab a huge discount off your NordVPN plan, go to nordvpn.com forward slash gold guest. You can receive an extra four months for free and there's no risk with Nord's 30-day money-back guarantee. The link is in the episode description box.